Amen. Hebrews chapter 11, and I'll read verses 9 through 16 for our text. We will not break these ones down verse by verse this morning, but um, certainly we'll have good reference to them. In Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 9, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city who hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed them that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if, there had been my, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity. They might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Let us look to our Lord now in a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love to us, mercy and grace and watch care over us. We thank thee, our Lord for this privilege you've given us to come into the house of the Lord, and as mentioned for the safety you've given each as they have traveled this way today. And we ask, Lord, that in everything we say and do, that we bring honor and glory to our honor and glory to our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I ask, Father, that you would be with me this morning as I serve it. May you give me liberty and ability to present thy word in truth and in love. I ask, Father, for the forgiveness of our sins, and these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. <clears throat> we'll title the message, We Are On a Pilgrimage. We Are On a Pilgrimage. I want to begin by simply stating that this world that we live in is not, for the child of God, our permanent home. We take up residence here, but this is not our permanent home. We are passing through on our way to heaven. In other words, we are what I will call on a pilgrimage. <clears throat> For we are they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, that we are pilgrims on the earth. In other words, we are on a journey, we as God's children, towards our heavenly home, as we read in verse 16. I also want to say at the beginning of this message that this pilgrimage is not designed to be easy. This pilgrimage is not designed to be all waterfalls and flowers and well, why would waterfalls maybe to some does not seem easy at all, does it? A lot of power there. It's weird. It's just not designed to be easy, and I'll start, I'll stop with that. Although many choose and or try to take an easy road, the pilgrimage that our Lord has set us upon is one where our faith will be tested, it will be tried, and you will get discouraged. But keep in mind, as I mentioned, this world is not our home. Living the life of a pilgrim reminds me of one who is running the race, of one who has the perseverance of the saints. It is more. It is a reminder that we as God's children are not to give up at the first sign of trouble, but that we are to persevere. And that we must keep on keeping on as we live a life as a child of God on our pilgrimage to heaven. And the other part of that is that we are not to treat this world as, is, as if it is our permanent home. Again, a pilgrim is one that is 
passing through. As I said, we do have residents here, but our citizenship and our permanent home is in heaven. This is not the place, that is, this world is not the place that we are to lay up our treasures. It is not the place where we are to set all of our affections. In fact, I would encourage you to set all your affections on the heavenly. I would encourage you to set all your affections on above. I'll tell you what, while we're here, we do have a work to do. May God give us the ability to do it. We need to be like Abraham, looking up and looking for that city. Remember, it said in our text here, Hebrews 11, 9, by faith. And that's how we are to live as a pilgrim, by faith. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him for the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's what Abraham was focused on. Not on this world and not in this life, but he was looking for that city whose, or, yeah, whose builder and maker is God. So this morning we will look at, first of all, what it is to be a pilgrim. Secondly, we will look at living as a pilgrim. And then thirdly, we will look at it is worth the pilgrimage. So first of all, what is it to be a pilgrim? Now I'm not talking about just going back at the beginning of our country and putting on one of those black hats and those you know ties like the pilgrims wore and coming across on the Mayflower. I'm talking about what it is to be a pilgrim in God's service. I want to spend just a few short moments explaining on what it is to be a pilgrim. The Bible is describing here a person that has been saved by the grace of Almighty God. And let me explain that now this way. My family and I are reading uh, through the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, uh, as part of our family devotion at night. And so it is just natural for you all, I'll just warn you, if you've not read The Pilgrim's Progress, it's a short book of like 9,000 pages. <laughs> just short of 1,000 or 8. Sorry, that joke didn't go anywhere. It is a wonderful book, and I say all that to say this. This probably won't be the only message that is going to be born out of a book that we are reading that long. It is a book that is written by John Bunyan. It was written in 1678. And so for some of you that may not be familiar with The Pilgrim's Progress, again, it was written in 1678, and it is an allegory. That is, it is like a parable. It is a story. It is a story about this world and that which is to come. As reference... This book, that is, The Pilgrim's Progress, is regarded as one of the most significant works in English literature. It has been translated into more than 200 languages, and it has never been out of print. The entire book, as presented as a dream sequence, as narrated by a narrator. The main character of Pilgrim's Progress is a man named Christian, who represents every man living in the city of destruction, that is the, this world, that's what the city of destruction is, on his pilgrimage to the celestial city, that is heaven. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Listen, but now, verse 16, they desire a better country, that is and heavenly, wherefore God is not to be ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And so this book, The Pilgrim's Progress, brings us through the life of Christian as narrated again through a dream. Now, you need to know that we are on a pilgrimage, and you need to know that Christian, though, started out with a great burden. 
Christian was living in the city of destruction. Now the city of destruction again representing the world in which we live today with a burden. The burden of course is sin. And Christian came to the realization that he needed to get out of the city of destruction to relieve himself of this burden. But what Christian found out was that he himself could not relieve himself of the burden. The burden that was upon his back. The burden that was upon his shoulders. Christian himself could do nothing to relieve himself of the burden. But thank God, God sent evangelists. And evangelists came and he told Christian uh, of where he needed to go and what he needed to do in order to relieve himself of the burden that he was carrying from the city of destruction. Again, the city of destruction representing the evil world in which we live today, the burden representing sin. And so evangelists came and spoke unto Christian and Christian went to that wicked gate and Christian there received the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. The relief of the burden of the burden crumpled and fell and was relieved off of Christian's back. But that's not the end of Pilgrim's Progress. But let me tell you, that's the first step in becoming a pilgrim. Amen. And that is being relieved of the burden of sin by the only one that is able to do it. And that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so Christian now is on this journey. Christian has spoken to his family. And we'll talk about this a little bit later as we talk about, you know, what it is to be on a pilgrimage. And is it worth it to be on a pilgrimage? And, and, and some would not follow him. In fact, many did not follow him. And they thought Christian strange. To want to be going relieved of this burden. You know, up to including his own family. And now that this burden has been relieved from Christian, life is just not necessarily, as I said, all flowers and easy. Christian has found himself in the slew of despawn. Christian has found himself fighting out against people that want nothing to do with talking about the things of the Lord. While Christian is going towards that celestial city. All right, so there's your quick pilgrim's progress somethingness. <laughs> As I said, though, got ahead of myself in the message here. Again, uh, Christian realized that he had this great burden upon him while he was living in that city of destruction. I mentioned that the burden is sin, and without the saving grace of God, you will be destroyed. Evangelist was bold enough to tell him that. And God was pleased to send Evangelist. You know what Evangelist is, right? Evangelist is a messenger to bring the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The messenger of God that preached the gospel to a lost and dying soul. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Thank God he sent Evangelist. And I am not claiming to be a great evangelist. I'm not claiming to be a great preacher. I'm not claiming to be any of those things. But I want to tell you, as I preach this message this morning, God has sent one here today to preach the gospel. Whether or not you, 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 you want to hear the message, whether or not you like the messenger that God sent, the truth of the matter is God sent a messenger here today. And this messenger, by the grace of God, is preaching you the forgiveness of God that is only in through the Lord Jesus Christ that is able to relieve your burden. It is God Almighty. And God is able to save. God is able to do this. When Christian found grace in the eyes of the Lord, right in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, which is our afternoon study, but hey, we're only on verse 3, so you know it's going to be a little while until we get to Ephesians 2, 8. Christian found grace in the eyes of the Lord, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So then a pilgrim is a child of God who is then set on a journey as strangers just passing through. As I mentioned already in the message, knowing this, that our wor this world is not our home. This world is not designed to be the home of the Christian. It has been marred with sin and we're just passing through as we have a heavenly home prepared for us. So I've got a mansion. Right? That's what the Bible says. We'll talk about that later. Oftentimes we come very comfortable with this world. Oftentimes 
We lose focus on setting our affections on things above. Oftentimes, as we are pilgriming, we forget that this world is not our home. We forget that we have something far better coming until we come to church. And then we're like, yeah, I have something better coming. But then life hits us. And we end up in this little despond. And, and, and people come, and they come and discourage us, and they tell us all kinds of things. Beloved, it'll do us well to remember that we are on a pilgrimage and that this world is not our home. It would do us well. It would do me well. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. It'll do me very well. <sighs> May God give us the courage and the strength to press on. Now, you've heard me say before, and I've preached messages on the blessings that God gives us and the enjoyments that God gives us and the pleasures of this life that God gives us. And God is so gracious to do all these things for us, but let us not take our thought and our eyes and our mind off of that heavenly home. We're grateful. God's given us good families, desirable friends, relationships, that we have companions whose company is delightful, children in whom we see many wonderful blessings. Many of us are thankful that we live by good neighbors and are generally liked where we are known. But we should be so far from resting in them that we should desire that we would be able to leave them all in God's due time. Does that make sense? I mean, all of these things that I mentioned are great, but let us not get so caught up in them that we have lost our focus on what's important, and that is looking unto Jesus as we pilgrim through this world. <clears throat> now, living as a pilgrim, Talk about living as a pilgrim. Beloved, I want you to know, and I don't say this because I'm excited about it, and I don't say this because I think this is great, but I want you to know that your friends and your family will try to discourage you along your journey. In fact, Christian's own family tried to discourage him as he was going towards the wicked gate after evangelist told him to go to the place in which he could get that burden removed and they tried to discourage him. And oftentimes throughout Christian's journey, there are those that try to discourage your Christian pilgrimage. Listen, people aren't going to try to discourage you if you're living like them. People aren't going to try to discourage you if you're not rattling them a little bit. They're going to try to discourage you when you want to be more holy, when you want to be more like God, when you want to read His Word, when you want to pray in public, when you want to do all those things that are awkward to the world. People are going to try to discourage you in your faith and in your pilgrimage towards that celestial city. Listen, they discourage you because your friends and your family, and many times our own selves, we don't like something. And that little something we don't like, and that your friends and family don't like as you're growing the grace and the knowledge of the Lord, as you're focusing on heaven, it's a little word that's called conviction. We don't like it. We don't like it. We don't want to be convicted. We don't want to change. Our friends and our family that know not the Lord Jesus Christ, they don't want to be convicted. So they will discourage you from living a life as a sincere pilgrim so they don't have to feel bad about not living according to God's Word. As I mentioned, this happened in the life of Christian as his family stayed behind in the city of destruction. Again, that is the world. and Mocked Christian for going on his journey, but Christian was focused on moving forward. May you, child of God, be focused on moving forward after that burden has been lifted. We should desire heaven more than the comforts and enjoyments of this life. And I like to become, I, I'm thankful, I'll tell you right now, I'm thankful for a bed to sleep on, amen? <laughs> I am. I am thankful for a warm house to live in. I am thankful for running water. I am thankful for the comforts and the pleasures that God has given unto us. In the song that we sang, A Child of the King, 
We, we say and give lip service to the words, a tent or a cottage, why should I care? But how many of us care? How many of us would say that it would bother us if that's what the provision was that God made for us? We sing it and we're like, no, it wouldn't bother us. Have you lived it? I haven't. I have spent a night or two in a tent or maybe two, uh, no, no more than two weeks, I'll tell you that. But it's not been my only place to live. What I say that I shall not care. I, I know that I would if my focus wasn't right. So, living life as a pilgrim isn't always easy. Right? Denying all of our sinful inclinations is not always easy. After all, I mean, look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. We need to be on the narrow way. We need to follow Christ. We need to follow the life that our Lord traveled while traveling through this life into our heavenly home as we're on our pilgrimage. We should do as we are instructed and take up our cross and follow Him in meekness and lowliness of heart. We must continue to travel and be looking for the city whose builder and maker is God. Some of my favorite verses as we talk about this are Hebrews Chapter 12. I mean, you, you just, you know, we're talking about sin, we're talking about burden, we're talking about discouragement, we're talking about laying aside some things, we're talking about, you know, not always being comfortable, you know, and all those things that, you know, there's some responsibility that Christian had to do as he was living life. There's a responsibility for every child of God as we make our pilgrimage through. And it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, wherefore, seeing we are also compassed. With so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down to the right hand of the throne of God. Listen, it says that we as God's children that have been saved by the grace of God, you have a responsibility to lay aside every weight. You have a responsibility to lay aside that which is comfortable. You have a responsibility to lay aside the sin that so easily besets us. Us, and you have a responsibility to run the race with patience. Now it takes some patience. Right? It does. But here's how you do it. You're looking unto Jesus. You're looking unto the one that saved your soul, that removed that burden of sin from you. I've said it before and I'll say it again, beloved. You simply cannot go wrong when you're looking unto Jesus. I've said this before and I'll say it again too. Peter was not going wrong when he was looking on the Lord as he stepped out of that boat by great step of faith. But as soon as he did what? Well, you've heard the story multiple times. As soon as he looked off and away from the Lord, he looked at the storm. He looked at what was going on around him. He did what? He began to sink. But when he was looking at Jesus, he was walking on water. I mean, that's awesome. Right? So living life as a pilgrim, as we're on our pilgrimage, not always easy. We're going to meet people that mock us. Right now, now Christian had a companion for a little while. Christian had a companion. His name was Hopeful. That's just a cool name, right? You know? <laughs> Hopeful. And they were traveling and they, and they found encouragement on those that had made the pilgrimage before them. And we can and should do the same. Now, verse or chapter 12 of Hebrews said, Wherefore, seeing also we are compassed, was so great a cloud of witnesses that we have pilgrims that have went on before us. Amen. Read chapter 11. <laughs> By faith, all these people, right? By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death 
By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen, as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should afterward or receive an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles and that. We read some of that. By faith. You think it was easy for Abraham to leave his home country? You think it was easy for Noah who was being mocked as he was building that great ark. You think it was easy for Noah on that pilgrimage to build the ark before the judgment of God came and he flooded this earth? Do you think it was easy? Because I'm going to tell you it wasn't. I, I'm not Noah and I'm not Abraham. And I haven't, I'm not comparing my struggles to that of some of these. But I'll tell you what. Wherefore, seeing we have so great a cloud of witnesses, and so Christian and Hopeful are along their way and they're brought to these places and they, they've seen and they're, they're being able to see those that have gone on and live by faith. As this verse taught us, we must also lay aside the sin that besets us. We all have what is called that besetting sin. Now it's been forgiven. Please do not think I'm mincing words or trying to confuse you. It's been forgiven by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that old devil, and he has a way of just bringing it back up. Doesn't he? We've got this sin that besets us. Crucify it. Get rid of it. Do what it takes. Get rid of the temptations. Get rid of the addictions in our lives as we are pilgriming through this world. Trust in none other than God Almighty to help us on our way to that celestial city. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, as I mentioned, people will 100%. I mean, you can count on them. Just about as sure as I am standing before you this morning, you can count on the fact that people will try to discourage you along the way. Now, let me be careful. Let me tell you this. Let me give you a secret or a hint. God just lost me. <laughs> Saved people that claim to know Christ will discourage you from living a holier life than they are. It's happened in my life. I think it's probably happened in your life. People do not want what I said, and that is called conviction. Now these people will come to you. Some of them will even speak pretty intelligently about the things of God. But they're set out to discourage you on your pilgrimage to that celestial city. <coughs> Beloved, as we desire to live our life for the Lord and spread the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will come in contact with people as named in Pilgrim's Progress, people like worldly wise men. What do you think he's wise in? <laughs> the world. Hypocrisy came into the life of Christian. Talkative came into the life of Christian. And so many more will try to discourage you as you live a, your life as a pilgrim. And don't forget this. That old devil, he's going to try to discourage you. One name of the devil is Apollyon. In Revelation 9, 11, and in, in Pilgrim's Progress, Christian has already... And again, I mean, I think we're, 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 we're not even like a hundred pages into the book yet. And all of this has happened on Christian's pilgrimage to that celestial city. And he has encountered a worldly wise man. And he has encountered someone that was talkative. And talkative talked about the things, or seemingly the things of God, but talkative was trying to talk Christian out of going on and continue on his journey. Talkative was trying to talk Christian of going back into that city of destruction upon whom those he left and joining them again and, and, and eating on those emotional cords. Christian encountered Apollyon here. In, in Revelation 9-11, we, we learn of him, and I won't say too much just to say he's of the devil in Revelation 9-11. And they had a king over them, which is an angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abad, uh, or I'm sorry, Abaddon, but the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. That old devil, your adversary, the devil, what does he do? Well, 1 Peter 5.8 tells you that. Your adversary, the devil, he's out there. 
He don't want you pilgrimaging for the Lord. He wants you going back to that city of destruction. In 1 Peter 5.8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That old serpent doesn't want you doing well on your pilgrimage. That old devil will tell you lies. That old devil will try to discourage you and get you off the way, but you remember that you're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. There are people who think they know everything, like a worldly wise man. And as I said, some even profess to know the Lord. And will try to lead you down that broad way, but you stick to that narrow way. You run the race with patience toward your heavenly home. Thirdly and finally then, is it worth the pilgrimage? Is all this worth it? And I believe by the authority of the Word of God that I can make this statement. Now, I haven't been through the whole life of a Christian, and I haven't lived my whole life as a child of God. Some of you have lived a little bit longer than I have. And I would ask you young folks, is that good? can I still put myself there? Yeah. <laughs> you ask an older child of God if it's been worth it. And I've never had one of them tell me no. It hasn't been. They all tell me yes. Yes, even the, even the times when money was tight, even the times when the relationship was rough, even when, when there were times when their children even rebelled, in all of it, it is worth it when your perspective is looking unto Jesus, when you have set your affections on things above and not things on the earth. Let me tell you, by the authority of the Word of God, it's worth it. So yes, we are just pilgrims. And listen, we may be beaten, we may be thrown into prison, we may lose jobs, we may lose our homes, again, a tent or a cottage, why should I care? We may lose loved ones for the cause of Christ. And that is why it's important not to tie yourself in too much to things in this world. Make sense? <laughs> Does that not, like, is it all kind of clicking? Like, it hurts to lose these things. And I'm not taking away or making a mockery of pain. I am not. But I assure you, it'll be more painful when you lose something in this life if your perspective isn't right and you haven't set your affections on things above. Does that make sense? Because one thing that old Apollyon or devil can never take away is your salvation in Jesus Christ the Lord. Ever. No one can take that away. So that's where we that that's what makes it worth it. Let me tell you, I've been I've been talking about this verse all throughout the message. John, here, this is good stuff here. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. John 14, verses 1 through 4. Let not your heart be troubled. I, I mean just let that sink in. I always just read right through that. I don't even slow down. Let not your heart be Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, you know, on the way you know. <coughs> Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. Praise God. There is no mistake. I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Listen, as I said, we are strangers and pilgrims just passing on through. We have a place prepared for us, so don't give up the fight. And I know sometimes it's hard. Christian hasn't come to the place where he's whining as much as this Christian does, I'll tell you that. I whine a whole lot more than I need to. I throw my own little hissy fits and I throw my own little woe is me's. And I'll tell you why I do that. Because I am not focused enough on the things above. It's just the reality. But you keep on keeping on. I got to read these verses. Y'all wouldn't like it if I didn't. I got to read these verses here. They're in Romans chapter 8. They go right along with this entire message. Got to read it. Beginning in verse just 35, 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Not Apollyon of the devil. That's right. No. Shall tribulation? Mm -mm. Distress? No way. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. Peril? No. Sword? No. None of those things. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I'm telling you. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is shown to us through His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here today having been saved by the grace of God, nothing, no one can take that away from you. Praise God. No one can take that. Now, weary pilgrims, people are going to try and discourage you and try to beat you down, wear you down. But you keep on pressing on. Live the life. Tell others about Jesus Christ. Tell them where you're going. Again, don't tie yourself down to this life, for we have a much better promise to come. That celestial city, that heavenly home, whose builder and maker is God, as we read in Hebrews. That place of perfection. The place where our Savior is. We will see Jesus face to face. Face to face we shall behold Him. And thank Him and praise Him and honor Him and love Him. It is the place, the heavenly place, that we will be able to enjoy the glory of God forever and forever. How beautiful heaven must be. And let me again remind you, if you have been saved by God's grace through the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, you are going. <laughs> you are going. If you've been saved. And let me tell you, your journey will be worth it all. Because you're going to a place of perfect peace, perfect singing, perfect fellowship, perfect everything. Heaven is a place of no sorrow, no pain, no crying. No canes, no glasses, no heartaches, no bitterness, no cancer, no hurt, no suffering, no sickness. That's how beautiful heaven is going to be. Revelation, this is our last verse here, Revelation. Now see, I told you I'm like on page, I, I, we're under page 100, and this is a long book, The Pilgrim's Progress. There would be much more to come in the life of Christian. Revelation 21, verses 3 through 7 says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And... <coughs> And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give unto them that a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. It will be worth it all. Now, As I close, remember this. If you're here today as a sinner, you are in the city of destruction. And there is a burden upon you, and that burden is sin. Until that burden is removed and you are freed from that burden of sin, you are not headed unto heaven. But let me tell you this. Jesus Christ, our Lord, He is able to save you. He is able to cleanse you from your sin and relieve you of that burden. For you here that are saved, you here that are on this pilgrimage, all of this message closed down. And you know, I rarely close with a song, but let me tell you, what a day that will be when my Jesus we shall see, right? So let's stand and sing that. What a day that will be. It will be worth it all.
It's in the folder. We'll stand together.